Buonasera a tutti, good evening to everybody. My name is Corrado Paina and I'm the Executive Director of the Italian Chamber of Commerce of Ontario, Canada, ICO Canada. Welcome and thank you for joining us today to the third edition of ITACA, Discovering the Circular Nature of COVID-19. This edition of ITACA is focused on the vision of circular health with Dr. Ilaria Capua renowned Italian biologist, best known for her efforts promoting open access to genetic information on emerging viruses as part of pre-pandemic preparedness efforts. Thank you to the Consulate General of Italy in Toronto, and in particular, thanks to the Consul General Eugenio Sgro and to the Istituto Italiano di Cultura and its director, Veronica Manson, for their support. A special thanks to Villa Charity that celebrates its 50th anniversary this year. This edition is dedicated to Marisa Piattelli, a former Eco Canada board member and a personal friend. A year after Marisa's passing, the values of responsibility, service and strength of which Marisa has always been the most fierce champion live in our community. A special thanks to Julie Di Lorenzo, president at Diamante, Diamante Urban Corporation, who strongly supported this initiative. Before introducing today's moderator and guest, we have now a video message from the Consul General of Italy in Toronto, Eugenio Sgro. As the Consul General of Italy in Toronto, I'm pleased to welcome the third edition of Itaca, a project conceived by the Embassy of Italy in Ottawa, the Consulate General of Italy in Toronto, the Italian Institute of Culture in Toronto, and the Italian Chamber of Commerce of Ontario, as an initiative aimed at bringing the relationship between Italy and Canada to the forefront of Toronto's collective mind. Ithaca is a conference a metropolitan event aimed at attracting a new generation of millennials and professionals that follow art and innovation, science and culture, the bold entrepreneurs that cross barriers and move society forward. Italy's representation in popular culture has generally been one of a trendy tourist destination. However, there's another Italy. This Italy embraces creativity, intuition, sophistication, courage, science. To tell the story of this Italy, we have selected several outstanding speakers to share their experiences with us at Ithaca. The current edition of Ithaca is focused on the significance of discovering the circular nature of COVID-19 and on how the connection between human beings and environment is something that needs to be preserved and fully understood. Indeed, today's conference features the re-evaluation of health in the light of a circular system that embraces both human and the environment that hosts us. It's my honor to have Dr. Eladia Kapoor here as a speaker of this third edition of Ithaca. Dr. Kapoor is the director of One Health Center of Excellence at the University of Florida and a well-known and renowned Italian virologist who dedicated her entire life and career to the study of viral infections that can be transmitted from animals to human beings and that cause poverty and food security issues. Moreover, Dr. Kapoor developed the vision of a circular health, a natural expansion of the One Health concept, which looks at the advancement of the human, 
animal and plant health by exploiting the big data made available through the advancement of the scientific research. In La Meraviglia e la trasformazione verso una salute circolare, her latest work, Ilaria Capua underlines that the COVID-19 pandemic has shown us how fragile human beings are and how we are all dependent on several factors, among which a prominent role has been played by a healthy and safe environment. Thank you for your attention. Consul General Sgro, thank you very much. And now I would like to introduce Anna Maria Tremonti. For 17 years, Anna Maria hosted CBC Radio 1's The Current and helped to make Canada's most listened to radio program. A masterful storyteller, Anna Maria delivers talks that touch the human spirit and captivate audiences. She believes the best way to navigate change in our world is to have more conversations and to listen. Anna Maria is now into the world of digital communication with a new way of telling stories and sharing ideas through original podcasts that illuminate, challenge, and surprise. Her interview podcast, More, is currently on hold as she works on a new serialized podcast, podcast expected for release in early 2022. She's also a former foreign correspondent and war correspondent and has extensive experience covering Canadian federal and provincial politics. Before giving the floor to Anna Maria, please let's watch Beautiful Science, an inspirational video celebrating science, scientists, and the passion they have for their work. Well, good evening, everyone. And um, good evening, Dr. Kapwa. Good evening. It's a real pleasure to be here and thank you so much for showing that video because every time I watch it, I just feel so emotional about it and I'm proud to be a scientist. <laughs> well, it almost made me cry. Well, it did make me cry. You've got an Andrea Bocelli and those beautiful images together anyway. It's, it's lovely to see and it's a good reminder of the, just the, uh, to underscore the importance of science. And uh, so I want to dive right in and talk to you because we have so much to talk about um, this evening. Um, so let's just begin. I, I want to get uh, just a, a, a better sense of where we are right now. You have called this pandemic a transformational event. What does that mean? Well, it means basically that there's going to be a before and, the, and an after. So if we look at history, we know that pandemics can become a, a, um, transformational events. For example, Spanish flu um, and the disaster and devastation that that pandemic caused, which was over 50 million people died and it didn't spread as fast as, as COVID-19. Well, um, the legacy of the Spanish flu also inspired the need for um, an, a national health service and um, actually um, was one of the reasons that um, fitness started becoming one of the important drivers of health. And so, when you have these transformational events, many, many things change. And so I think that our challenge now is to ride on the back of that change and not only suffer from the devastation of this event, because it carries with it, um, I believe, a lot of positive energy as well. And I want to ask about that, but um, uh, before I ask where you think this is going to go, um, you have made the point that there are lessons in this pandemic, and you've even identified like seven lessons that will, I guess, help us navigate and think about what 
white might lie ahead in the future. Am I correct in terms of what you've identified that way? Yeah, so I, I put together um, for a, a T20 event, which was held a couple of weeks ago in Milan, um, seven pandemic teachings. So the pandemic is telling us certain things. Actually, it's screaming in our face certain things. And we have to um, listen and uh, try and make the best of these teachings that in some cases may completely shake, you know, the way that we have done things until now, or certainly shakes what we believe until now, because I am certain that um, most of the people who are listening, like most of the population, the general population, wasn't really expecting a pandemic. I mean, there were quite a few of us that knew that a pandemic was going to come and it was just a matter of when and caused by what virus. So, of course, um, this is, you know, a, a shock, even to learn that you are vulnerable, that people are, are vulnerable. I think that's a really good point. And I'm, I'm going to go through the, the, the individual lessons with you, but I think that's a really good point, um, learning that we're vulnerable, because I think um, so many of us have felt invulnerable. And this pandemic has shaken that sense of, of what we can do just on our own, right? I mean, it's an invisible enemy. Absolutely. But I also think that all of the people, the ordinary citizens, they thought that whatever came, somebody would have fixed it fast. Like, like we must have some sort of medicine, okay? And I'm, I'm using these words on purpose, um, some sort of treatment or some sort of, you know, uh, mend for this. And we didn't because this was an unknown virus. We didn't have, and we still don't have any antiviral drugs. We have a vaccine but it took us one year, beautiful science, right? In one year, science was able to deliver a vaccine which works. And this is also something that, you know, we tend to give for granted, but it's, you know, it's vaccines don't always work at these levels. So science delivered incredibly well, and now we, we are in a different situation. But at the beginning of 2020, we were fighting with bare hands against this invisible enemy. It's worth pointing out, huh? like that is extraordinarily fast and that is the miracle of science. Um, and at the same time, um, the, the people who question the vaccine question how fast and you know the rest of there's so many others who are going oh they wanted it faster it's a um but it is extraordinary the timeline but we are living this like this is not a history lesson for any of us we're in the midst of it we're living it yeah this is living the experience i actually have a course uh, for undergraduates at my university which is called the circular nature of covid 19 and living the experience like what could we have done better where did things go wrong because, of course, uh, some things did go wrong and some are still going wrong. Well, uh, so take us through um, the seven teachings and they begin with the recognition. And I believe this is the basis of circular health, that humans, animals, plants and the environment are interconnected. Tell us more. So you may remember this ancient saying that uh, a butterfly that flaps its wings, battito di ali di farfalla, um, can create a monsoon on the other side of the planet. Well, it wasn't a butterfly, it was a bat, but it happened. And we know from even, I think that now even lay people from lead, leading, reading newspapers, they understand that when human beings encroach certain ecosystems, they create an unbalance that creates a domino effect on a series of health drivers. And so I think that one of the strongest messages that the pandemic is giving us is, hey, we live in a closed system here, right? So planet Earth is a closed system. And therefore, if something happens on one end and that that is happening is not good, it will have a series of repercussions that are um, hardly predictable 
I mean, who would have thought that, you know, this virus could have become so pervasive? And of course, if we bring into this dimension also what is happening to the uh, plant, to the animals and the plants and the environment with, with climate change, which I don't think that we can deny any longer, um, I think that this is the core of the new way forward. We have to take care of health of the system. Of, we need to have healthy people, healthy animals, healthy plants, and a healthy environment. We can't have healthy plant people and sick animals because the sick animals are a part of our diet, and so are sick plants part of our diet. And so I think that... Um, it is very clear um, that we, we really need to try and preserve the balance and preserve health as a system uh, which touches all living organisms. And I should just tell those watching this evening that there is um, a chat um, a system where you can put in questions. We will take some questions uh, as the evening goes forward. Um, but uh, my question now, your second lesson's about the power of institutional denial. What are you talking about there? Well, um, when I was young, I used to um, work with other virologists on uh, pandemic preparedness plans, right? At an international level and at a national level, because as I mentioned, we knew that a pandemic was going to come. We knew it was going to come from the, from the animal reservoir. And so, you know, you start laying down guidelines. Now, I can tell you that in it was, you know, 15 years ago, you know, before I moved to the States. But um, I can tell you that in none of those documents, um, it ever would have been stated Article 1, all the leaders of the world will comply to these guidelines because it was sort of obvious there's a pandemic and the world health organization which is the organization that is supposed to keep the world the people healthy says we have a public health emergency of international concern which by the way is pronounced fake public health emergency of international concern. Anyway, we have a fake, and it was taken as a fake, F-A-K-E, by several leaders around the world. And this created an immediate division of opinions. But to fight a pandemic, you need everybody to be doing the same things or else we're never gonna be able to get out of it. And so when um, cer certain leaders, I mean, Boris Johnson had to be hospitalized in intensive care before he realized that the problem was so serious. And at the beginning, um, there were all sorts of rumors saying, but this is a nothing, we can, we can put up with this and it's not going to be a problem. And if you do this, what happens is that leaders are leaders because they have followers, right? So followers <laughs> follow what their leaders tell them to do. And this happened also in the United States. It happened in Brazil and in several other countries. And so if you don't act at the start, all in the same direction and all trying to fight this enemy with the tools they have, and you lose half of the, of the population, you know, the virus is out of the bag. I mean, it was probably, it was already out of the bag because it happened under circumstances which were rather unfortunate. And I'm referring to the Chinese New Year, the, the Lunar New Year. So basically, just before the country was put into lockdown, um, many, many citizens had moved to other parts of China. And so, of course, it was already um, elsewhere. But still, you know, when there's an in, a public health emergency of international concern, Everybody has to listen and do, I'm sorry, but do what you're told. Right. And so instead, it, it is, this wasn't the case. So that's the, that, that's the one factor that the scientists didn't think would happen, which was the institutional denial. And yet hand in hand with that is social media. And you have called social media the greatest drivers of health. 
and not necessarily in a good way. What, what do you mean by that? Well, social media, I, I think that, okay, so viruses behave as viruses, okay, and, and we know more or less how they behave, but they're moved around by people. And people nowadays are very much influenced by what is in social media. And so social media, we know, has fueled misinformation, also amplifying denial. And although it has also supported the circulation of good information. And so we have biological rules that govern an a pandemic, right? And, and so how many people get infected? And, and we have numbers that relate to the pre-social media era. And actually, you know, also to the, this is, it also happened in a moment in which globalization, it was much more pervasive than, you know, even the previous pandemic, which was in 2009, which was the swine flu pandemic which I might, can I just say a word on this swine flu pandemic? Yeah, because go ahead. It's really interesting. So how many of you remember that there was a pandemic in 2009? Not very many. This pandemic is the pandemic that, that deceived us because it was a pandemic caused by a novel H1N1 virus coming from pigs. And it had the potential to spread like wildfire. However, it did not spread like wildfire and it did not kill elderly people because influenza viruses generally, even like COVID, right? It's mainly the elderly people who get very sick because they had antibodies to um, one of the descendants of swine flu, of sorry, of the Spanish flu, which was cross protective. And so it, it became a mild pandemic. And so decision makers re believed that we could manage pandemics, but actually we managed that pandemic because there was a pre-existing immunity, not because we were good at managing that pandemic or particularly good. Interesting. Very interesting. Well, you know, um, you broaden it out to the world and I, I want to talk about your third lesson because it really is about other parts of the world beyond um, North America and Europe even, and that is vaccine equity. You call it a fundamental priority. What are you seeing that's bothering you when it comes to vaccine equity? Well, it's clear that we are vaccinating the, the people of the world who were born or live on the rich side of the world, and the poorer side of the world is has problems in um, in even having vaccines delivered in their in their country. So we certainly have a capacity issue. And also at the beginning of the pandemic, in the United States, it was much better. But in Europe, there wasn't enough vaccine that was that was available for the different countries. And there was a lot of tension about France having more vaccine than Germany, than Austria, than Italy, and so on. So certainly we have an issue with capacity because we need to be able to respond faster. Once we have the vaccine, we need to be able to scale it up. But I think that that's not enough because we are still using vaccines that are perfect for Canada <laughs> because they need the cold chain, right? So they need to be uh, produced, stored and delivered at low or ultra low temperatures. And you need electricity, right? So if you don't have fridges and you don't have, you know, a very or a very cold ambient temperature, you can't keep these vaccines. But a lot of the world and a lot of the south of the world does not have the temperatures you have in Canada and does not have um, electricity all the time and certainly does not have great refrigeration capacity. And so one of the urgent priorities that we need to address is how are we going to get vaccine to developing countries um, and not that cannot don't have cold chain facilities? And the answer is we have to develop new generation vaccines that are stable at ambient temperature, because only in that way we will be able to vaccinate the rest of the world um, in a short period of time and be efficient. Because if the vaccines they're not stored properly, they lose in potency. And so then 
they don't work very well. Do you see that urgency in um, in development of a vaccine? Like we saw great urgency in the development of the vaccines that are available to us right now. Mm. But do you see, is there more work being done that um, that we may not be aware of where that same urgency is happening uh, to get around the the issue of the of the cold storage? Well, just recently, Richard Hatchett, who's the CEO of CEPI, which is the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness, has included thermostable vaccines in their work program. And I have to say that um, together with a group of women colleagues um, working with the G20 engagement group for women, the Women 20, um, we, we, we pushed this idea through the G20 documents, and um, I think that it is now on the radar screen of decision makers. And the reason we pushed it through the women uh, group of the G20 was because if we can have better vaccines, the burden of the pandemic on women can be reduced because women need to look after children and members of the family who are not well. And if we can get suitable products to women uh, that can maybe be even self-administered like plasters, we can actually free women from the burden of um, diseases in their, in their in preventable diseases in, in their household. Uh, this is uh, um, also one of your lessons. I'm going to jump the order here because you talked about women, because one of the pandemic lessons, lessons uh, that you point to is that it, COVID has affected men, women, and children differently Yeah, on many levels. Take us through that. Yeah. So this pandemic is a, an incredibly pervasive event. So it's like a wave, right? Like, like a wave and everything gets wet. Everything gets soaked. And so women and females and males and children are all affected by this wave. And hey, they're not affected in the same way. Wow, what we are, as we said before, we're living the experience. And what are we seeing? Well, we are seeing that from the biomedical point of view, children very hardly get sick, very rarely get sick. And that's good, but they do get sick. So it's not that they are completely resistant. We are seeing now some cases, but overall they are less susceptible to clinical disease than adults. But between men and women, there's also a very big difference. Um, men get um, die more, they get a more severe disease or disease with more severe outcome, more than, and, and women instead die less. Uh, in some countries it's actually two thirds of men who develop, um, to, of all patients, two thirds are men and one third are women who develop the severe form. It goes as far as that. Um, so certainly there are some biological differences in how men and women, but it's not only that, it's that women are more compliant with rules and women are more respectful of guidelines. And so it could be that, that women can, you know, are more, pr protect themselves more and actually um, support the rest of the family in being protected. But women have, have lost most jobs, at least in Italy, um, women have been hardly hit by the pandemic. And of course they have to take care of the sick members of the family. And so the point I want to make is that this is the perfect excuse to finally stop looking at population data as if men and women were the same, as if we were dolls. I don't even know how they make dolls anymore, but we're not. I mean, we are different and this has um, medical, biomedical, but also social ramifications. And so one of the, um, let's say the, the grand challenges that we are launching is that from now on, scientists should only look at data that are disaggregated for sex at birth and gender when from the pandemic onwards you said a transformational event well this can be a truly <clears throat> it's easy 
and it can be transformative because we know that um, there is a bias, for example, even on testing um, medicines and drugs, it's, they're mainly tested on men. I mean, it's not so bad now, but the stuff that was licensed 20, 30 years ago that we're still using um, was, was mainly tested in, only in males. And so I think that we have an incredible opportunity to say, stop, men and women are different for men, and this is good for men and it's good for women. And we need to look at that data uh, by default there should be no question whether you know we can study um, study it disaggregated by set. Let me give you an example. We are doing some work on on trying to understand the relationship between mobility, mental health, and use of drugs like for depression and and whatever. And so we've done all this lovely study, and we said. But look, can we have the data disaggregate? Because it makes a difference if you're a male or if you're a female, right? How much you move and how much you get upset over certain things. Can we have it disaggregated by sex? And, and they said, well, you can, but you have to pay another 30,000 on, on, to get that, that data from it. And this is not fair. I mean, why should we be paying a scientist? Why should we be paying? this is data which is disaggregated by sex and, and gender it should be like age right or you know nationality it should be provided by default it's interesting that that that, that gap is in the data because you have long argued about the need for collaboration among scientists around the world and to really use big data to to move forward at an accelerated pace when it comes to the work that you're all doing. Like data is really important and the, 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 like what you're talking about is, is really like it's, a, it's one of the pillars, correct? Yeah, but this is real world data. I mean, the pandemic is the most measured event in history. We were measuring lots of things before as well, right? We were measuring weather, we were measuring rain, pollen, allergens, how much do you travel, where do you go, all of that. And now suddenly we are measuring a whole load of other stuff, even mobility, like where are people going? The, the ping, right? And we know, we know so much that we should use this because this is better than any data that you can generate in the lab. It's real world data is what is happening. And of course, the data is dirty. It needs to be clean. It's, we're using it in an emergency. It has lots of fragilities but I still think that it represents a unique opportunity. And I'm gonna pick up more on what you say about women and they, how they bear the greatest burden because you really are talking about that, um, the intersectionality of, of, of this disease, how it affects um, uh, different marginalized groups, how it affects women. Um, and you talk about the economy too, you know, uh, uh, the economist in Toronto, Ar Ar Armin Yalnesian talks about the fact that we are in a she session so, uh, you know, um, when it comes to the economy, we have heard many arguments against pandemic measures because they would ostensibly negatively affect the economy. And you see the, the, that relationship uh, with the economy and health a little differently. Can you explain that? Yes, in the very few words, there is no healthy economy without healthy people. So we have seen, because, I mean, pandemics are unique events because it all happens at once, right? So, for example, you measure the impact of diabetes over, I don't know, 10 years or 20 years. Just think of concentrating that impact in one year. It would be a catastrophe um, because it would overload uh, all the health system, right? And pandemics, what they do is they have this violent attack rate and everything happens all together. And so... Um, that's why they are events that transform um, our economy because they happen in a condensed way and therefore there can't be an economy if people are quarantining or are sick 
or are busy caring for their relatives. And so actually, among the many, many, many documents that have been um, you know, prepared during the G20, which was in Italy and other uh, groups, um, there is one which is um, actually a WHO Euro report, which uh, ad advances the concept um, of health in all policies. So basically what, what this means to me is that health should be the, the center of all the other policies because we have realized now that we don't have it because we're worried that we're going to get sick or we have been sick or we have lost someone, we realize how important that is. That's the problem with health, that when you're okay, you don't value it, but instead you should actually, you know, like make sure that that you maintain your health and that you keep yourself healthy because if you don't have that, everything else collapses. Um, I want to get back to the the um, the wider, more circular um, uh, issue of health that you have um, underlined and that you work so much on and that is the subject of your book as well. You say we cannot mess around with our planet anymore. What are you saying? Okay, let me give you uh, an, a, a very easy example, antimicrobial resistance. So antimicrobial resistance is equals superbugs. These superbugs are super killer bacteria, which um, are resistant to virtually all or the vast majority of antibiotics we have. We have a gigantic problem with antimicrobial resistance because the more you use antibiotics, the more you generate strains that become more and more resistant. And I'm sure that among the people who are listening to us, there is certainly someone who has had a relative or a friend who um, uh, got, got a hospital acquired infection maybe died, struggled to get out of this hospital acquired infection. Why? Because these bacteria are resistant to everything. And so there is virtually no drug that we have that can stop the growth of this, of this bacteria. But bacteria who, who inhabit us actually don't inhabit us all the time they come from other sources and you know where they come from they come from the environment they come from food they come from water um, in some parts of the world so antibiotics are licensed in certain animals in pets and of course in farm animals um, and they if the more we treat these animals the more we will force the selection of these um, resistant bacteria. And they will then contaminate water and they will then contaminate the environment and they will come back. This is an extremely urgent problem. There are countries that actually use antibiotic to treat diseases of plants. And so you wanna know where that goes. So basically we are altering the microbiome of the planet by using immense quantities of, anti, of antibiotics and creating these resistant bacteria. So this, this is, is one example, which is, a, a, so before COVID, antimicrobial resistance was deemed to be the biggest health threat for uh, human beings. During COVID, we, a lot of antibiotics have been used, a lot. And so the problem has only gotten worse. We need to take all this information from hospitals, from practices, from uh, the veterinary world, from the agricultural world, from water testing, and understand what, how the situation is and act towards antimicrobial resistance, not only with a top-down approach, but with a bottom-up approach. People need to understand that every antibiotic that they throw and they throw in the trash, goes in the environment. And they and this needs to stop because we we cannot survive in a in a, in a planet that has ferocious bacteria that you, we can't stop. 
It's interesting. I, it's uh, I, again, we're we're at that intersection, that collision of all of these big issues, and COVID has piled on top or hangs over it, but it didn't wipe out those other issues. I mean, we look at the the parallels with climate change right now um, that are becoming apparent um, in ways that we knew they would. Yeah, I mean, let's just so climate change without talking about. The, the things that we know, but look at wildfires. They are obviously related and and sustain moments of, of heat and, and, and a different climate. And wildfires destroy billions of animals and they destroy biodiversity apart from the trees and apart from the oxygen that those trees can generate and apart from sequestering the CO2, we are destroying the ecosystem with wildfires. I'm sure that hardly anyone, now that I'll mention it, will say, ah, yeah, do you remember the wildfires in Australia before the pandemic? What a disaster with all those animals that, that either died in the fires or they couldn't feed, they couldn't drink, they couldn't, I mean, it was a, this is a catastrophe and, and it also happens because everything is much warmer and fire sustains itself in that way. And we don't even have to go to Australia. We know this from the fires and the forest fires in British Columbia and other parts of Western Canada and also in California, that the fires burn hotter and do more damage. And they also create their own weather systems. Um, and the fire, um, the actual seasons of forest fires are now much longer. Yeah. all playing into what you're talking about, about that balance that we need to not only think about, but accelerate our thinking on. You know, your, your, your final lesson is about scientific illiteracy and how to tackle it. What do we do about that? So um, I think that it's clear that we can't solve problems just academics talking to academics or um, scientists talking to scientists. We, we need to engage the people because the strength of transformation comes from people. And I think that we have an incredible opportunity now because of COVID, because people are concerned about their health. They understand, going back to what we said at the start, vulnerability, right? They suddenly perceive this vulnerability and they suddenly um, start thinking about the bigger picture and they start understanding that they are part of a much bigger system that pertains to their relations with other human beings, but also to the relations with um, animal, other animals and plants and the environment. And so I think that this is a, a, an incredible moment to make people curious about what they can do. Um, there are many things that as individuals we can do to treat the planet in a better way. And certainly decision makers can decide as much as they want and they can, they can you know, impose regulations, but, but transformation that way will take much longer than if people embrace it and understand it. And this is what circular health is about. Mm. I, 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 I've got a question here. I'll, I'll go to a few of the questions uh, that, that speaks to um, policy um, in many places. And it, it says, in light of what has been said so far, in your opinion, is it right that vaccines have not been made mandatory yet? We know they are in some jurisdictions and other jurisdictions they're not. In some they are partially. Um, uh, any thoughts on that generally? Well, it, it, in, so this is like because nobody had thought about it before the pandemic, right? We should have had this sorted out before it happened. But Italy has taken a very, very bro uh, brave approach. So it hasn't made it mandatory. It has made it mandatory to go to work with this green pass system. So you either have a full, you're fully vaccinated or you need to test yourself um, 
twice a week so that you can go to work. And I think that this is a, a very powerful, persuasive measure. Actually, the, Span the Portuguese, the Spanish and the Italians are among the European countries that have the higher, highest level of vaccination coverage. And I think that this is a, an incredible success for our public health organizations and for the leadership. If you consider that Italy and France and Spain were hit really hard at the start. I mean, they were um, at, at the beginning of, of, of 2020, what happened in the north of Italy was was really, really scary. Um, and 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 what I find in inverted commas, um, surreal, well, I find surreal is that other European countries were saying, oh, but this is only going to happen in Italy. It won't happen to us. And then it went to Spain and Germany and they were saying, and the British were saying, it's not going to happen to us. And then it went to the UK and the Americans are saying it's not going to happen to us, which means that, of course, there was a denial. A, a, they were refusing to, to, um, to, to understand really what was happening. It's interesting because you make the point that the Spanish flu, of course, spread much slower, but because of the, our, our ability to move around globally, this moved very quickly. And, and yet, um, you know, scientists like yourself can almost plot it on a graph on how long it takes. And yet there is still some of that denial institutionally as well that, that doesn't plan for those timetables. Yeah. This is the this is why we have to have novel approaches to managing health issues exactly for this reason, because we can't take the effect of denial out of this equation. The, the virus behaves as a virus. It's moved around by people, but it's moved around more by people who don't believe in it than by people who do believe in it. Um, another question um, from our, the people joining us watching this tonight. In your opinion, what kind of mistakes should we avoid repeating in the future? Um, I think that next time that this is going to happen because there is going to be another pandemic. I'm sorry. I'm really sorry. What I can tell you is that with influenza pandemics, the interval is every 11 to 40 years. So um, let's say that you get a couple of pandemics in your lifetime. That's more or less. Um, certainly, we, I think that we will listen more. We will be more prepared. This has been learning the hard way. And I think that nobody's going to question um, the use, of, of course, apart from deniers, but w the people who understand the magnitude and the issue that, that is being faced will not be too fussy with restriction measures. We will have, um, I think that we, <clears throat> I think that we will change our lifestyle and in a way that it will be easier to manage future pandemics. I mean, remote working is now part of our life. And this, of course, um, is, turns out to be very useful in the midst of of a pandemic. So there are a series of things that we will have learned. Um, I am unsure if we will travel as much as we used to. And uh, I think that uh, when we see, so Orientals, they, they wear masks when they have a cold. And, and this is something that uh, a lot of Europeans always looked at as something strange. Actually, now we will expect people to stay home if they're sick. And if they really have to go out and they have a bit of a runny nose, then we won't look at them as if they were um, crazy if they wear a mask. But we will actually be thankful because they, it's a way to respect our health. You're talking about normalizing um, different um, patterns of behavior that become normalized in the wake of this pandemic. Mm. I, when I flew back to the States from Europe, I thought we're never gonna get rid of masks on planes. Like, would you go in a full on a full plane 
without a mask now would you feel safe ask me if i'll go on a subway without a mask no. <laughs> right no it's, it's it's yeah i mean but of course from planes you can get pathogens that come from the other side of the world i mean the risk is yeah. higher but i think that there will be much more attention i mean think about what got normalized after 9-11 uh, mm. airport exactly se airport security surveillance things that are now an accepted normalization by most people and and some of this long tail of COVID, we're not even sure where we'll, we'll go but but we're already starting to see how we are changing the patterns of behavior as you point out well um, hiv is another example how that has changed our patterns of behavior so that's why these pandemics are transformational events because they 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 change you they make you aware in this case of, of vulnerability and therefore um yeah we we have to change and this doesn't mean that things that we have to change in our everyday life are not frustrating every time i go to the airport and i have to take off my shoes and open the bag and pull out the computer i'm frustrated so it's not going to be you know it's just going to be add-ons which we're going to have to put up with because yeah we've learned well here's a question about the science um this comes from uh, one of our viewers another transformational event was the widespread use of mrna vaccines are those vaccines the game changer the silver bullet is if so what is the future for that new technology so mrna vaccines were um as you know um it is the first time that they were put on the on the market and actually they worked really really well um i think that we still have to um learn a little bit more about the duration of immunity with these vaccines because um you know we're living the experience and so um certainly there's a lot going on um in the vaccine uh, manufacturing and R&D world on how this technology can be used uh, and for what other diseases it can be used. Um, it does require uh, low temperatures. Uh, although um, I, I, um, I was reading uh, the other day that there are some of these uh, mRNA vaccines that can be stored at room temperature for a certain period of time, or certainly at plus four, so that's better. Um, I think that mRNA vaccines will have uh, a, a relevant role in prevention in general. You know that they are using them for cancer as well. And um, I think that uh, they will receive investments and um, they, if they perform as well as they performed in this case, um, they will certainly be one of the tools of the future. Final question here, uh, is the loss of authority of institutions and governments to blame to a certain extent? And how can that authority be regained? Well, this question, um, brings me to the issue of populism. So the pandemic arrived on uh, a terrain which had already been shaken by populist movements. And populist movements, um, they, they really, um, they lead by pulling the guts of people, by trying to make their emotions um, stronger than the knowledge and and by creating a framework in which you believe in something you read it and therefore that is correct it doesn't matter what other people say and this has obviously shaken um many things but it has created this conflict between the elite academia and and the good people or and 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 generally the elite can also be corrupt and so the certainly in italy but also in other countries um these populist movement have 
discredited experts. They have discredited competence. And therefore, there has been a loss of uh, trust in institutions, which is, I think, one of the biggest disasters that can occur because people don't believe in, 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 in who is in charge of them. And of course, then they, they don't know where to, to bang their head and, and you get unrest. So um, I think that we should use this um, experience that we are living through actually to find ways to revalue competence um, and revalue knowledge. Maybe as academics, I'm an academic, we need to be a bit more open, we need to be a bit less condescending, we need to be try and speak to the people, speak to the people. And um, that is, I think, one of the big challenges that we will have to face, because without institutional trust, everything is much harder. So much work on the horizon. Um, Dr. Kapwa, thank you so much. I I'm gonna hand it back to Corrado now, but um, thank you for all your insights and for sharing all that you have learned or a bit of what you've learned. <laughs> thank you. And if I may, I wanted to thank you for inviting me, especially because this event is dedicated to a woman, uh, Marisa Piatelli. So thank you very much. It was women, uh, the two of us who in her memory, um, discussed about the challenges of the future. So thank you, thank you for, for, this, um, for this moment. Thank you very much. Allow me to say, Dr. Capua, that I really appreciate your words about Marisa. Uh, we had the pleasure to work with her and to meet, to meet her. She was an incredible human being and she was an icon in the city. She was working actually in a very important body of the city. The, uh, restructuring and the building of the new city. So, and, and, and you know, we, we really miss her every day because uh, she was an important element of our organization. Thank you again for your words. But thank you in particular to Anna Maria Tremonti and to you, Dr. Kappa, for, for the things that you have said. Uh, it's great to be a witness of this conversation. It was in, an intelligent and constructive conversation I really believe that you gave us a formula, a recipe, which is the recipe of the Romans. You know, things come, but even worse, the bad things bring with themselves some important lessons. And uh, I really think that we learn a lot with the two of you tonight. Thank you again. Allow me now to go through the long series of thanks. I'm sorry. Uh, special thanks go to the Consul General of Italy in Toronto. Eugenio Sgro and the director of the Italian Cultural Institute in Toronto, Veronica Manson, for supporting this event. We have a video message from Veronica Manson. Good morning. It is a real pleasure and an honor to support today's event. And on behalf of the Instituto Italiano Cultura in Toronto, I would like to thank the Italian Chamber of Commerce of Ontario and its director, Corrado Paina, for organizing this seminal talk. I would like to thank also Dr. Ilaria Capua, who has been a very important point of reference, knowledge and advice to navigate this almost two years of global pandemic. A warm thank you to also to Anna Maria Tremonti, that as a journalist has posed all the right questions to help the general public understand the reality as it evolved and keeps evolving. What have we learned from this challenging and difficult pandemic? I thank Dr. Kappa for helping us answering this question, presenting some very important considerations that go beyond the medical field and embrace our future way of life. Thank you. Thank you, Veronica. Uh, for your information, the Instituto is a center for cultural and academic activities and a school of the Italian language. At the Instituto, they offer Italian language courses from very beginner to advanced levels. For more info, please visit their website. Once again, a special thanks to Villa Charities. Villa Charities' mission is to celebrate and promote Italian heritage, culture, language, arts, and family values. For almost 50 years, 
they have played an important role in supporting the Italian community in Toronto and the GTA. And thanks to all the Eco Canada team, my God, I was almost forgetting Mary, Ilaria, Monica, Richard, Astrid, Tiziana, Marisa, thank you. Thank you very much for your work, your tireless work. Thank you. Those two years have been a great ride, by the way. Working with you was a pleasure and an honor. Thank you very much. And uh, I want to thank everybody now and say I hope to see you soon at the next edition of Ithaca. Have a good evening. Bye-bye.